Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for um, for the, this great conference and for the discussion. I mean, I enjoyed the paper. I, I, I must say at the beginning, I really like the point. Uh, I, th I think it's super important and super interesting. And the point is very clear, right? So we have a lot of models thinking about macroprudential policy, but they use a current income approach. Uh, but there are many reasons to, to believe, and personally, I do believe, that it makes more sense to think about the future income approach, right? That you say, you think about when you're borrowing, how much are they willing to borrow to, to lend you, depends on how much you can pay in the future. And uh, for me, it makes a lot of sense. I don't know, it's an empirical question, but at least for me, it makes more sense. So the idea, the, the, I think the, what? Well, they say something about the price effects being internalized and that's why uh, the, the equilibrium is constrained, is constrained efficient, and, and if the collateral constraint is, is forward looking, then there's no need for intervention. They, they say something interesting. Uh, they say that you can, you know, these models with uh, uh, current and future income constraints can generate exactly the same moments. And, and I like this point, point also that uh, the cost, you, you have to choose, you don't know exactly what is going on. You can still always do macro regulation, uh, macro prudential regulation. And even if you're making a mistake, the cost is not that big. Okay, I like that point. I think Sebastian didn't say anything about that. And, uh, but it's good. I, overall, I really like the paper. I really like the point. I had the same point as everyone. When you read the paper and you try to understand what is going on, you get dizzy, right? You don't, I, I, it's, it's really hard to follow what is going on in the theory. Um, uh, so I'm going to focus my discussion on that. So I'm going to do something similar to what Sebastian did, but I'm going to play exactly the same game as Diego. I'm going to try to do exactly the same model as they have, and I'm going to show you how would I prove it, okay? And I mean, hopefully it's going to be better, okay? So the first thing that is super confusing in the paper is, does it matter the lack of commitment? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that it matters. Then there is an issue they set up again. It's not clear what is the equilibrium they are using, uh, but when you look in the appendix and you try to understand what it seems to be history independent, they assume differentiability. So it's sort of like, you know, it smells like a mark of equilibrium, it walks like a mark of equilibrium, and it, it talks like a mark of equilibrium, right? So I'm gonna set up the model as if it, as if it were a differentiable mark of equilibrium. And that's gonna be my game, okay? If you want to do more general, you want to do more general definition, you have to use APS, Abreu versus Stachetti or Felan Stachetti, and then you can do the same, but it's not gonna matter, okay? So what is the key, the key objects in, in the paper is, one is the price. You have this tradable price, or the price that I'm gonna call, if I'm using exactly the same notation as in the paper, and then you have this collateral constraint. And the difference is that when you have the current income, how much you can borrow depends on the price today. Right, and that, and that is the key, the, the key point. And this is like the Bianchi 2011. Why, when you do the future income, how much you can borrow depends on the price tomorrow. And that's it, okay? So what happens here, and, and let me tell you a bit of notation. When I use a small letter, this is individual of the equilibrium, the regulation free equilibrium, and the big letters is what the planners do or the, or the aggregate allocation. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some proof in here using only the second the second constraint. Putting more general is not gonna change anything. Okay? So what is the key point of the equilibrium? The equilibrium you can write it like uh, using value functions, and there is a bunch of conditions that the typical you know complaint that is lagness. You have the feasibility, all of that. But the key conditions are the Euler equation, what I call condition one, and the envelope condition. And the key point is that the equilibrium, the, in the risk-free, in the, in the regulation-free equilibrium, the, the envelope condition holds. While in the planner's problem, the envelope condition may not hold. Okay? So if you have that the, the planner solution and the equilibrium are equivalent, it has to be that the envelope condition holds also for the planner. And that's it. That's gonna be what I'm gonna try to show you. And that's it. And the reason why the envelope condition holds for the individual allocation is because the price, when you are making decisions about the future, your, the price depends on the aggregate, not on your individual decision. And that's it, okay? 
So instead of doing all this notation, I'm going to write the Markov equilibrium. And you write the Markov equilibrium, what, what do you have? You have a planner that it has to choose consumption and debt uh, and is subject to the feasibility constraint and subject to this collateral constraint. What does it make in a Markov equilibrium is that the planet is taking the continuation value as given and the consumption and borrowing decisions and the future price decision as given. That's it. You don't need a lot of notation, that's it. That is the whole setup that you have to write, okay? And uh, this, this is how I would write it, right? And then what I'm gonna try to show you is that this problem satisfy conditions one and two in, in, the, in the equilibrium that I showed you before, okay? And that's it. So the first thing is that when you write the planners, Euler equation, uh, as, as uh, Diego showed, so this is the Euler equation of the planner. There is a negative, there is a negative in here is because they, D is defined as debt. So don't, don't get confused about that. And then you have the planner when it's constrained has its multiplier, but also internalizes and can change the future price. Okay? And then you can do the same trick as Diego did. And then you can show, you can make these two Euler equations equal by assigning, by redefining the multiplier. And this is also, you can do the same in the current income uh, collateral constraints. And that is what it leads to the indeterminacy of taxes in this kind of models. That like here is not gonna happen, okay? So the key point is that we can show that the derivative of this continuation value function satisfies the envelope condition, you are done. And that's it, okay? So what do you do? This is what the only thing that we need to show is that the, the contribution value functions have to satisfy the envelope. What do you do here? You simply differentiate the continuation value function. Okay? And then you're gonna see here, you have the first part related to the envelope. That, that is what, oh, sorry, there, is a, there should be a minus that I forgot, that is a typo. And then you have the manipulation that the planner can do, okay? So this is, if you look at this, this is like the Euler equation where the multiplier is zero, this is exactly zero. So the envelope condition in the planet, if in the future, you expect that the, 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 the constraint is not gonna be binding, this is zero, and then the two solutions are equivalent. That's it, very simple. But when, when the future constraint, when you expect that in the future, some collateral constraint can be binding, this is not zero. And then you have incentives to manipulate the future borrow. Okay, and this, this term is the key point. So what happens when you have the current income, the current income collateral constraint? So if the, is, is, if the constraint is binding in some period, you have this equality, you can differentiate the, how, how the, 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 the borrowing changes uh, with your debt emissions, and you're gonna see that it's not zero. Always that you bleed more, more debt in the future, you leave, you leave more debt for the future. So you're gonna change the future prices. And then what you use is you manipulate the future plans. That is like the typical macro potential model. It's like a, a Bianchi or Enrique has models like that. This is exactly what happens. But what happens in this kind of model when I try to do the same? Now I have, this is the collateral constraint. And the difference between this one and the previous one is that now the, the, the borrowing depends on the future borrow. You differentiate this condition, and what you get is that you cannot manipulate the future. Uh, it's that simple. Okay? In general, this term, there's one minus this big chunk, is not one, it's smaller than one. That you need to put some conditions for uniqueness and stuff like that. So this is in general positive. And what you have is that the only, the only possibility in this equilibrium is that you cannot manipulate. The, f the future borrowing decisions when in the future the constraint is binding. So if the constraint is not binding tomorrow, you don't want to manipulate it. And if the constraint is binding in the future, you cannot, okay? And that's it. That is exactly what is going on. And, and, and actually they could write the proof like this. If you read the appendix, I, I couldn't, you know, it's like, that's what I did in a different way. You can extend this proof to other environments and it's gonna be more clear and transparent. But two things about this, commitment doesn't play any role. Uh, and, and it's basically that you cannot manipulate. If, you're, if, if your future guy, the future party is deciding to be constrained, you don't want to affect it because the constraint is just basically, it is what it is. Okay? And that's it. That is, that is the whole intuition. Uh, 
just to conclude, I don't know how, how, how am I with time, uh, Martin? Five minutes. Oh, perfectly fine. So, so the only thing, so the only thing that remains, the question that remains in there is like in general, it's known that these problems with future income constraint versus the problems with current income constraint, they have different implications. And Enrique was quite, was was wondering about that. And, and then if they have different implications, so, uh, you know, only the current income constraint seems to be working in the day. But what they do is like, they put a shock today to the borrowing constraint. So it's true that you're constrained by the future income, but the shock to the border, to the collateral constraint happens today. And that is how you reconcile the two models. That is the whole trick, okay? Once you do that, you can generate exactly the same moments, the same statistics, you can cook it a little bit more. And what it, what it leaves you is with the two models can generate exactly, not exactly, but similar moments, qualitatively the same, the same uh, cyclical properties, but they have completely different policy implications. One model is telling you, one model is telling you you should do macroprudential policy. The other model is telling you you shouldn't do anything. Leave the market to act free. Okay. Uh, so they they they, they ask this question. I, I I also like that they ask this question that they say, look, given that we don't know, you have to assume that you're a policymaker. The policymaker also doesn't know, uh, you know what what is going on. So you may choose to tax when when you have a future income constraint. Or you may choose not to do anything when you have a current income constraint. That would imply a welfare loss and could be problematic. And they show that taxing what is not needed is an order of magnitude. The cost is an order of magnitude of not taxing when it's needed. Okay, And um, I, I like that, spo that point. Uh, but I, I think it's an explanation of why this big asymmetry, it, 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 it will be interesting. I didn't have time to go through the details. But maybe you can characterize a bit, a bit more. So to conclude, I really like the point. I like the paper. So I don't have actually I don't have many comments about anything else. The only problem is like it looks obscure in some way the theory. I, I, you don't know where the things are coming from, and there should be a big value. There is a big value in trying to make it more transparent, more clear. Just eliminating a lot of notation that I think is not helping uh, in, in in any way. At least the reader Sebastian was equally confused as me, I think. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Facundo. Um, so Diego, why don't you take a few minutes to address uh, the comments of Sebastian and Facundo if you want, and then you can pick some of the questions in the chat and in the a &Q, um, and yes. uh, use about 15 minutes to do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the, there's also the um, Pablo and Paolo who are panelists, so we'll share, I guess, the answers. Um, so thanks both um, Facundo and Sebastian for great discussions. Um, I think they were, they were great. Um, I agree with you, Facundo, that when we wrote the paper, actually it was a couple of years ago, I think now actually, I hope that my presentation was a better communication of the results because we grasped the intuition uh, after we finalize writing the version that you have. So hopefully with your comments, uh, Sebastian's and uh, our now more mature interpretation of the model, we'll, we'll be able to write a more clear uh, second draft of, of, the, of the intuition. Um, then about the, so there's um, a couple of comments that were uh, repeated and uh, I think were great and, and our comments that uh, at least once we have kind of like, one is about the role of, of commitment and we're working on it. Uh, I think, uh, I hope that uh, we'll be able to include it, um, at least um, uh, some, some, some initial thoughts on, on how the role of commitment interplays in here. Um, I, I think that um, we've been working on it and, and we have to mature it a little more, but it seems that there is some room for, for you know, some announcement of policies um, in the sense of, for example, uh, you know, fostering borrowing uh, post-crisis that may actually alleviate the, the constraint in crisis. That is something that uh, a planner with commitment could do and a planner without commitment couldn't. Uh, our our uh, approach to kind of like doing the baseline without commitment comes mostly from first two things, right? One, we want to build up on this great literature that has been uh, done in this thing, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this type of model. Second, uh, 
consistent with the idea that the financial frictions are coming from lack of commitment problems, we also kind of wanted to play a fair game and uh, think of the government uh, as lack of commitment. And we think that's a kind of like a realistic capture of uh, what the problems are for emerging market uh, um, policy makers. Well, but uh, Diego, there yeah, the, the, the lack of commitment is different, right? Because on the one hand, the collateral constraint comes from a lack of commitment on the part of the borrowers yes, yes, yes. who are private agents. And the other is the, whether the social planner lacks commitment or not, right? So, no, 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 I, I, I agree. It's a certain, we're kind of playing a fair game in the sense of government vis a vis household, but I completely agree with your point. And that's actually why I think, independent of that, it's good to understand the, also the, the interventions of, uh, of, uh, that are desirable in a context with commitment, and we think they are different. And maybe Paolo can expand a little more on that. Um, but anyway, that was kind of like, uh, and then uh, last one last thing about uh, two points. One is thanks point for pointing out the fact that we're, we're showing that the welfare costs of, of misspecification or more misspecification are, are kind of small. That's, that's something that uh, we're highlighting. Uh, and I mean, we're, we're trying to put everything in the, ta uh, in the table without taking much more normative stance. That's how we're kind of like trying to write the paper. And about the the um, there were some some various comments in here let, let me just like i think i i partially address this when when enrique asked the question but this is certainly a not a the, the the future the future price model is not a model that gives the you know the idea of this fisheries and the deflation uh mechanism that we agree right the idea is like you don't have the the financial amplification if you want uh, and then the question is whether exactly right as researchers are we are we, you know, favoring uh, models in which, uh, you know, if you just have the income shocks, then it's 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 clear. And uh, I I, um, I I think we make the point clear in the in the paper, which is without uh, without the kappa shocks, you cannot uh, rationalize center features in the data. But uh, the question then is, uh, how plausible are kappa shocks? I mean, we we don't want to take a stance on that. We're just saying that if you add the kappa shocks, as has been done, for example, in other papers or. Uh, Guerrero Lorenzoni, just to name one, um, then we actually um, uh, re recompose not only the unconditional moments quanti quant quantitatively, but also the dynamics uh, in the crisis, if you think of, of the crisis being delivered by a combination of a drop in output and a drop in uh, kappa. Uh, I think those are mostly my, re my reactions. I may be missing things again, like for, you know, pointing out the, the things to improve in the paper, but um, Thanks again. And uh, let me just also open up uh, Paolo or Pablo, you want to add something? Yes, just one little thing about the commitment. Uh, thank you very much for the comments. Um, so we were thinking about this idea that with commitment, the government may want to kind of stimulate borrowing in the recovery from the crisis. But the idea, I think, is that even with commitment, there is still no role for macroprudential policies, ex ante. Uh, so like the point that the two policies look very different is even stronger if you uh, consider commitment to some extent. So that's why we can went I say, for... Can I say something about that? When, when, if you want, to, you want to make a point about the lack of commitment, I think the way to do it, and I never, I was looking in the paper, in general, when you write about commitment, you say, look, ex ante, you want to do this, now the days arrives and I change my mind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, exactly. And, and there's nothing in the paper that that is, is, is around there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very no, but, simple. Uh, the, but uh, so the, suppose that the kind of commitment you have is of a social planner that maximizes from the timeless perspective then the Euler equation of the planner is going to have current and past Lagrange multipliers. Yes. Now, in that case, it may or may not be a coincidence that when that constraint binds, yes. uh, you know, for the, for the planner, it also binds for the private sector. So it's, it's not clear that in that case, it will still be uh, optimal not to intervene. Yeah, yeah, I, yes, I, I completely. Yeah, sorry, Enrique, I didn't want to. Yeah. I just, just want to add to what Martin was saying. So I think it may be that the best place to look 
for in this context is, is the model with the capital, because the, the big drawback that you have here is when you move to the model that has the future price, you lose the ability to generate the crisis without these kappas. In the model that has capital, with the price of capital since it is forward looking, the future price will decline and will affect the borrowing capacity of today as a result of the decisions that you make today. And that doesn't happen, cannot happen in the setup as you have it right now. Mm -hmm. That creates a lot of differences. And it's also why you can get the result that Facundo got. If you put the price of capital in the constraint, the issue of commitment comes to haunt you exactly like Martin said. And there's something that we look in the paper with Javier. So in, in the paper with Javier in the JPE, we have an extensive analysis of the implications with commitment. And the way we solve it is exactly like Facundo said, you write the planning problem and then you have the, the future decisions or the future planners characterized as part of the functions that the current planet takes is given. And then we found this implication that you are having differences between what the optimal policy will be on their commitment. And you will have this lag multipliers explaining that essentially what you will want to do there is when the constraint binds, you will want to prop up the price of collateral by pledging that future consumption will be low. But with that, once you take out the commitment, then the policy without commitment has this sort of macro prudential component to it. And you have the fit kind of complementarity between this policy you will do when the constraint binds, but it will have to be constrained by the fact that you have to control the incentives of the future planners. So you cannot just prop up tomorrow's capital price the same way that a planner with commitment can. And we kind of got off through the discussion of this. And it's exactly between Facundo and Martin, the arguments that they give you. But the advantage in that model is that that model still will give you that there will be a sudden stop with the fisherian mechanism, even if you have tomorrow's price in the constraint. To me, the thing, the thing about today's analysis is that if you have to generate the crisis by changing the model, I think that's, that's all the case. If you say, if the model is not the fisherian model, then the fisherian policy argument is not valid. And that's it. I think then it's QED for whatever the reason is. Here you have a reason that says, if I change the model and put the future price, there is no fisherian feedback. And that's it. And you know, then that's not the model. That cannot be the right model to justify the policy. But but that is less rich. And you say, no, 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 I have a model where I can get a fish area and thing. That's the model that's sort of stuff. I'm gonna change the price. I get a different policy implication. Then I think things hinge better. Um, but that's that spoke too much already. No, it's a great, great suggestion. I mean, as I said, like that's a um, um, work to be done in the sense that uh, we should incorporate uh, the analysis of commitment and try to explain it as carefully as we can, at least in a baseline model. And hopefully, as uh, Enrique was saying, if we can extend it even more to the model capital, that'd be great. Okay. Any other comments? Roberto, Roberto has a question. Yes. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, great paper and great discussion. I really enjoyed that, and I think this is a very interesting and important question. Um, I have uh, two. Um, questions. One is, um, I'm not quite sure if you cannot differentiate in practice uh, the two models. I mean, you talked about some evidence that one might actually look at for um, uh, for differences in the two specifications, but I can imagine other um, indicators that may actually uh, uh, suggest a difference between the current uh, collateral constraint specification against the future one. Like for example, asset prices. I mean, uh, are the implications for, for us in prices, for example, of the, of the two specifications the same? I would be surprised if, if they were, right? So, I mean, that, that, that's one suggestion. But the other thing, probably more important, um, Facundo mentioned something about um, uh, Abreu Pirsaketti kind of equilibria, and uh, that actually made, made me wonder whether uh, the results uh, hinged uh, very uh, delicately on the assumption of Markov perfect equilibria. I mean, I have here, here two questions. One is, well, uh, is there a, a presumption or a, a demonstration that there is only one Markov perfect equilibrium, right? Uh, in, in, or if there are multiple Markov perfect equilibria, then it may be the case that macroprudential policies may um, have a different kind of effect, which is to help select among different equilibria, right? Um, and this is more general in the case, um, if, if you actually go to the uh, more general set of uh, sustainable plans, for example, in the terminology of, of Chair and Kiho, the Abreu-Pristaketi 
kind of idea. I mean, in fact, you know, that set is, is just like a mild extension of Markov perfect equilibrium. I mean, if you look at, for example, my paper in 1998 on credible, um, uh, credible uh, planks, for example, you can see that uh, you can obtain all of the uh, sustainable planks essentially by uh, in a Markovian way, right? So, uh, you know, this is all to say that it may be the case that if you think about the multiplicity of equilibria in the absence of commitment, then a macroprudential policy may have a very different uh, uh, role than what we are used to think about. The role of probably like selecting equilibria and making like uh, the evolution uh, of equilibrium uh, history dependent, where this history also may depend on the decisions of the government as to, for example, macroprudential taxes, right? Um, and in the context of this paper, just my, my last thought, it may be the case that the two specifications have different uh, implications for the set of possible uh, mark of perfect equilibria or sustainable plans for the matter. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto, and uh, thanks to all participants and for great discussions and very useful comments. Uh, so on the on your last point, Roberto, so I think uh, Martin and Stephanie have a, a, a very nice paper on, on, on this role of policies, maybe selecting equilibrium. So we are so far abstracting from it, but I think it's related to, to the work that Stephanie and Martin have done, but we did, can definitely discuss it in, in this paper. Now, to your other comment also on uh, how to differentiate between models, let me take kind of the, the opportunity of um, mention again that from a macro perspective, um, it, it is, we found at least quite hard to distinguish between these two uh, classes of models, even for, you know, the real exchange rate will be the, the kind of the relevant price in, in that one. Uh, we, we can check also some more asset prices, but at least from the typical business cycle models that we analyze uh, in these uh, models, both type of models are quite plausible. And you know, with, with a Kappa shock, if you want, we are not departing from a tradition in macro finance that a lot of the papers within this literature, uh, uh, Enrique and Javier's JP paper for him, for example, and, and many other papers, use these, these type of shocks. So I think in principle, both models can speak to the same macro data. I think a promising avenue that we are not conducting in this paper, but just to kind of put everyone on the same page, at least what we have in mind that could be promising to distinguish between these models is more with the use of, of uh, maybe micro level data. Uh, and this is will be kind of a following ideal exercise. So imagine, let's say that you are a lender and a borrower comes to you and you know that today the, the borrower has a high income, but you know that, for instance, the, the firm in which the uh, worker is working on has just exit, and that borrower is for sure would probably be one become an unemployed tomorrow or in, in the next period when the borrower is supposed to repay the debt. So the question is, how would this lender price its debt? Would it, would it price it with today's pay stub, which is higher? Would it uh, put uh, would be putting some some way to the fact that let's say that worker becomes unemployed with, with right to one. So that, that is, I think, uh, what, what we have in mind in terms of what can be done uh, in, in additional empirical analysis in future work to, to help guide uh, the policies. And here our ideas is, you know, if, if we are going to be doing a macro provincial policy that seems to be very important, uh, evidence for trying to, to, to distinguish between these is we think of a first order importance uh, in, in, in guiding such policies. Okay, I think we um, run out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Diego, Pablo, Paolo, and the discussants, uh, Sebastian and, and Facundo. I believe we have a break now, so we will be resuming uh, in, a, in a while, I think. Thank you.